Hello and welcome to Maven's Athenaeum, where you'll find magic hidden in plain sight. I'm your host, Maven, and I'm so excited that you're here with me today. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode one. Today we have with us Trina Tackett. How are you doing today, Trina? Hey, thank you for having me. I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Uh, do you want to tell everyone what the book we are discussing is and a little bit about it? But before I let you do that, I want to mention the trigger warnings because I almost put the book down. And um, if you have a hard time with tough subjects, then you might too. So the trigger warnings are infidelity, divorce, blood, miscarriage, death, molestation, sexual assault, suicide, and poisoning all of the uh, all of the appropriate elements of the 18th century which makes sense because uh, the book we're, we're looking at is the lost apothecary by sarah penner and uh it's very interesting how it's written because it's a novel written in a way that follows three different characters perspectives and uh for two of them it follows the growing relationship between nella clavinger and eliza fanning and it's set in 1971 in London, and Nella runs a small business, which is a secret apothecary. Uh, she has a hidden store that's kind of need-to-know basis only, and it exclusively serves women. Um, and it's a shop that almost exclusively deals in poison, not entirely, but what she does is she offers poison in order to get rid of horrible men. And uh, previously, the apothecary had been, uh, quote-unquote, reputable when her mother ran it. Um, her mother taught Nella how to make all of these different cures. And one of the themes in the books is kind of using knowledge where you can make a medicine with a little bit, but anything in big enough quantities is toxic. So what Nella does is uh, preceding some... or following some life crises of hers she ends up using that knowledge to make poisons instead and uh, Eliza ends up in the shop she's kind of there on behalf of her household her mistress sends her there in order to uh, find a solution for a troublesome master of the house and she ends up coming to the shop in order to seek a poison to help get rid of him and while she's there, she ends up becoming fascinated. Like, uh, Nella has ways of disguising poisons. Uh, in Eliza's case, she ends up hiding something in an egg. She seals it up with wax, and you can't tell that the egg has even been touched. And to a 12-year-old, this is awesome, apparently. So, uh, Eliza becomes absolutely fascinated with the newfound knowledge and ends up returning to Nella's shop later, which is something that no one's supposed to do. And, uh, through that, she ends up sort of bonding with Nella, who didn't really want her there, and the book just spirals into chaos for both of them following that. And then the third perspective is told from the perspective of a girl named Caroline, and it's interesting because it's set in the 21st century. We're not entirely sure when, um, but probably somewhere between 2016 and, like, present day, which is all it says in the novel. It just says present day, but just going off the publishing time, and correct, but... From Caroline's perspective, it follows her story after she arrives in London on her belated honeymoon alone, following the infidelity of her husband. And while she's there, she ends up embarking on a journey of self-discovery and accidentally discovers a huge historical treasure in the process. And it's really interesting how all of the plots sort of weave together, especially with a 200-year gap. Well said. Thank you. So, how did you get a hold of it? Um, well, after you recommended it to me, I ended up getting the book on Audible because uh, one of the horrible things about adulting is we all try to make time to read, and then, of course, we're, uh, we never do it. Um, so, I've really been enjoying listening to audiobooks so that I can multitask and get things done. And uh, the performance on Audible is really, really well done. They actually have three separate narrators and I appreciate the efforts of uh, making British accents that each of the narrators does as well. It's kind of a full cast. Um, it's read very, very well. And for me, it ended up being very cathartic to listen to, especially since I had a very long trip out of town recently. And it's one of those books that it's read well enough that it's worth buying it, if that makes sense. I know that if you have a bad narrator, it kind of kills the novel, but mm -hmm. this one works very, very well. Oh yeah, full caps are always worth it. 
they're a lot of fun. And if you can get a full production one, those are even better. Those have sound effects and musical background. They're the best. Absolutely. I got the physical copy because I wanted the recipes and poisons that Sarah Penner put in the back of the book. And since that isn't available widely, I'm going to put it at the end of the episode for those who want it. So I don't have to bother those who don't want it. I'm going to switch into the questions now. I'm going to ask and then you can answer and ask me back or ask the next question, whichever you'd like. So as we mentioned earlier, Nella renovates her mother's apothecary shop into a poison dispensary. This happens after her personal betrayal and she seems to resent her decision. She constantly thinks about it as how it's like a blot or a stain on her mother's memory of helping women and, you know, helping them get through their life with ease. And then she tries to carry on that legacy by helping women through dispensing poisons to get rid of their terrible husbands. And the first time that her poison is supposed to be used for a woman, uh, she gets caught, technically. So, what do you think of her decision to change the shop? I don't want to say I can empathize with it. I can certainly sympathize. I remember thinking while I was reading it, um, there's another book. It's The Tales of Despero, I think. I don't remember who uh, wrote it. But there was a line in there that talked about how after your heart breaks, sometimes it grows back crooked. And uh, what happened with Nella is she had been betrayed by a lover and once she was expecting a child of her own, he ended up using a quote unquote remedy, which he had originally come into the store for and he used that to poison her so that she ended up being very, very sick for years and miscarrying their child. And then she proceeds to poison him. And I think it's interesting that she decided to, instead of just going from remedies to help women, which it is noted that she still does that after this tragedy occurred that she decides that instead of uh, simply offering cures for things she's going to make sure that there's a way to get rid of men so that similar things don't happen to other people i think it's one of those morally gray areas where you're like okay but also it's like i get it and especially if you're talking about 18th century you know society now we have problems where uh things aren't necessarily set up equally for women all the time but imagine the 1800s i kind of understand her approach and uh i'm not saying that i would start a little shop to poison people but i, I think would. that <laughs> yes I, I think i think in a way it's just another form of helping it's just one that takes a slightly darker term and i think she has trouble like rationalizing that sometimes but i get it it's still ultimately still a shop to serve women though it's just in a different way yeah also, just out of curiosity, which character did you relate to most? Take a guess. I would have bet on Nella. Correct. <laughs> she spent through a lot. Part of me also related to when she says she feels old and tired. And, you know, <laughs> at, the, at the wizened old age of 27, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> well, who was your favorite character? Um, I definitely, I liked Eliza Spunk, but I liked Caroline the most. Uh simply because like she's easy to relate to struggle she was going through was something that i could directly empathize with and i understood and it was kind of nice hearing a character go through this and actually kind of come out on top on the end because again it's fiction but fiction is nice because it shows us that at least in a fictional world things can turn out okay and it kind of gives you hope for real life so and then also she, like she's a modern character she has a cell phone i like my wi-fi and caroline also has a kind of adventurous spirit and a deep interest in history and that's something that i can relate to as well and i enjoyed her spunk what did you think of nella and eliza's relationship i thought it was sweet it was nice to have kind of a mentor student in a relationship but also it's kind of mother daughter and uh Eliza's only 12 years old, and she wasn't necessarily supposed to show up and stick around. Like, I admire her tenacity, but it's kind of nice to see Nella not necessarily soften up. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but to have an opportunity to bond with a daughter of sorts, uh, especially after her personal loss. And there are a lot of times in the book where we can see her thinking about her own daughter. I think at one point she said she would have been 19 years old or something like that. Um 
so I think it was really nice that the author decided to put in a a child essentially it was a little weird because I can't really relate to 12 year olds at this point in my life but I thought it was very very sweet uh I thought it was I mean it was at least a an honest and respectable relationship neither one was taking advantage of the other um obviously things would have gone much smoother if Eliza had just stayed at home but I kind of get why she wanted to go back to the store. I've been a 12 year old that's been scared of an adult before so I get it but also if I was Noah I'd have kicked her out and been like sorry squirt bye. Yeah there's definitely something um no offense to any younger <laughs> listeners who might be there there's something about 12 year olds that kind of makes you want to strangle them in a weird way and it's just part of being that age you're kind of awkward but there's also something really refreshing about a child and they can just say and do things that a lot of us won't and i thought it was a really interesting element to add her as uh just one of the perspectives in the novel it gave it a very different feeling um so yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed Eliza, but it is a little bit strange, especially since there's a lot of, um, I don't want to necessarily say adult themes, but I would not necessarily want a 12-year-old reading this book, if that makes sense. I don't know. I, I read some pretty advanced books as a 12-year-old. I think that's up to the supervising adult. Well, that's fair. Who was your favorite side character? Did I already ask you this? No. Okay, excellent. Who was your favorite side character? Gaynor and her dad, Bachelor Al. I would agree with you. They're kind of hard to separate, especially since in like the audiobook version, they very nicely read them both with lovely British accents. <laughs> so they were definitely wonderful. They're, they're definitely intertwined, not just because of the father-daughter duo, but because Caroline meets Bachelor Alf, and then he's like, I know somebody who would help you over the life. <laughs> that's, some, that's something my dad would do. In a weird way, it kind of reminded me of whoever the librarian is in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, Giles, that's who I'm thinking of. There's always that character with the British accent in the library who helps. It just made me very happy. It's a little bit cliche in a way, but like in the best way possible and uh gator is definitely like the uh the giles of the book it makes me very happy i like her i imagine her with like springy red hair yes i pictured her with spec like spectacles as well but i don't know if that's just because the librarian thing it just feels <laughs> wrong if they don't have them <laughs> there were very few in-depth description of the characters which was really hard for me in remaking the title art absolutely like that it, it's frustrating from an artist's perspective but i kind of liked it at the same time because you could just get to fill in the blanks but mm -hmm. yeah the only person we kind of got a description of was eliza i think mm -hmm. and like a little bit of nella like sometimes she looks old sometimes she seems to look kind of young but she's tired and but there's not a whole lot like the reader gets to fill in a lot with their own imagination yeah. Did you know what mudlarking was before you read the book? No, but I want to try it so badly. I will give all of my mudlarking time to you. Oh man, it's gorgeous. And uh, for those of uh, you who are listening, mudlarking is essentially you put on some boots, you put on some gloves, and then you go dig around in the mud in the river and you find cool stuff. And it sounds glorious and I want to be involved. But if this is real, I, I want to do this. <laughs> I don't. So, um, for sure, yeah. I don't. Oh, but think of the treasures. You could find no. a, you could find anything. Yes, I can do that in an antique store and the internet. Okay, well, I, I guess that's fair. You we have get, Google. What what do we need mudlarking for anyway? To but. get bit by a catfish. <laughs> to step on a broken bottle in the mud and yes. No, I, I still would 100% do it. Um. So this is something that I think we uh, had mixed feelings about, but what did you think of the ending of the book? I felt like it was rushed, like somebody was sitting over Sarah Penner's shoulder going, finish the book, finish the book, we want the book now, book now, no wait, book now, when like she could have had some extra pages. I It kind of looks like with the physical copy, maybe she reserved those extra pages 
for the, the recipes um, and the poisons and some, there's not like an epilogue, but it's like, it's like a foreword, but at the end where she thanks people and it's nice, but like that's 15 or so pages of extra story. Come on, man. Yeah, and uh, I didn't feel like it was particularly rushed, but I know that for me, I also listened to it in a very different uh, format as far as delivery. Mm -hmm. And an audiobook is a totally different experience than actually reading a physical book. But what areas particularly like bothered you and what extra, I guess, information or details would you like to have seen towards the end? As much as I hate to say it, a temper tantrum from James. (laughs) <laughs> she has to go back home and do stuff and like get it organized. I want I want to see one more narcissistic temper tantrum from him where she can just be like, "No, like you messed up. I'll be back, but you sit stay behave." I I don't know, just a little bit more. I know some pe- I know that you felt it was very closed and offered the closure that is satisfying to everyone i mean in the sense that a novel can i didn't think it was necessarily true to reality um so the thing with caroline is she finds out right before her 10th anniversary that her husband is having an affair therefore she goes to london by herself and it's hard but uh i think for anybody who's ever had a partner or a relationship where there's been infidelity involved it's a lot more traumatic than it was in the book and I would agree. I would like to have seen, like, James try a little bit harder. Like, yes, he, he did try to self-poison himself for attention to get her to feel sorry, which is a very, like, narcissistic thing to do. But it, it did feel a little bit too clean-cut and quaint. But at mm-hmm. the same time, it's fiction. So part of me is like, I'm okay with that. But but I see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. For sure. Like, it's not necessarily particularly realistic. I kind of wonder, um, I don't want to presume anything about the author, but part of me feels like maybe she hasn't gone through this herself because I know that if I were Caroline, I would have been a wreck uh, sitting on the bathroom floor crying in the hotel room for at least a week. I would not immediately have been able to go out and go mudlarking. Mm -hmm. And I would have a bottle of wine next to me and I would be on the phone with my best friend Rose who uh, I honestly would have liked to have seen a little bit more interaction with Rose like she's kind of mentioned but she's not really a character if that makes sense I would be up for a second book where Sarah Penner picks off picks up on uh, Caroline's first semester at her new program and how she checks in with Rose who maybe took over the job that she had in her hometown because Rose was like a stay-at-home mom. Maybe she took over the job and could get some extra income and I don't know, maybe, uh, or maybe not. I don't know. I don't care. But like more contact with Rose and maybe Rose comes to visit her for like her graduation towards the end of the book if it's a longer book. Um, More time with Gaynor and working on her, what is it, her thesis? Is that what it is? The, the, the big long papers that nobody actually wants to write. <laughs> yeah, her, her yes. big important paper that she wanted, her dissertation. The, the, the scholarly paper that none of us actually want to write, and I don't think <laughs> the people writing them really want to write either. Those wow. things, yes. But, like, all I, of that would be nice because I'm sure she'd do some more research. She might go mudlarking again. She might go find out what happened to Nella and whether or not Nella was, like, real or a ghostie that was dealing with Eliza, adult Eliza's problems. Um, all of that. And then, like, what happened to Eliza and then some fictitious move to America or some something. That's fair, actually. Like, I kind of enjoyed how uh, when you get to the end of the novel, everything is kind of open-ended. And I enjoy that in a way because I like filling in the blanks. But at the same time... It would be a little bit nice to know because I think we came to very different conclusions about how the end of the book worked. Um, mm-hmm. And actually, speaking of that, like, what did you think of the role of magic in the novel? Because I know a lot of it was kind of centered around uh, the idea that magic wasn't real, and like Nella was very adamant about that. And she did give Eliza a spell book that she had, but it was kind of more to humor the child who was assuming that all of the things in the apothecary were somehow magic or something. Um, 
but like how did you feel about it did you feel like it was a real element in the story do you think it was just coincidence like so actually it would have a couple different ones just based on who I am as a person so thinking about it from like an author standpoint I don't know Sarah Penner personally but maybe she was going for a magic in plain sight kind of vibe where you know reality meets the the unreal and uh you know I that's kind of what I took it as but because of my religious beliefs a lot of what I believe in is that science proves these quote magic things that happened in the past where people were like (gasps) gasp witchcraft um no it's just science like the full moon came out and a lot of women are bleeding oh congratulations everybody's synced up to the same cycle and it just so happens that our bodies are made out of water and the moon is a tidal giant that has electromagnetic waves that move large bodies of water so for example when eliza makes a magic potion to reverse ill luck and then jumps off the bridge and survives yeah they read that more as luck There was actually some discussion online about how she could have potentially mixed some sort of, um, I don't want to say alcoholic, but like there's concoctions that you can make that take time to distill that when you drink them can create a warm feeling in your body and that would technically save you from a fall into an icy river. Now that could just be an expansion of fiction and it's a miracle that she's alive and maybe there are unseen forces at work like a god or angels or you know sky daddy i don't know but the author makes it look like it's magic in everyday life and that it's there if you want to see it and it's just uh, a miracle if you don't want to see it as magic that's fair Um, When I was reading it, I hadn't even thought about, like, the temperatures of the water and stuff, which makes very, very good sense. Like, my thought was, oh my gosh, there is magic. It's just kind of tied in at the end, and it's sort of of teased, if that makes sense. And, Mm -hmm. like, part of me wants to believe that, yeah, she survived the fall and didn't drown because she had a magic potion and it worked. Um, But I I don't know. I appreciate that it's open-ended, but I, I also, part of me is like, okay, I need answers, but... What was your opinion of James? Oh, I I hate him. I think there could have been more done with it, but I think that she did a pretty decent job of writing about how a narcissistic uh, character, particularly like a uh, cheating lover husband, behaves. And I think that she accurately portrayed like the manipulation and stuff that they will go through i think that real life people he's terrible like he is absolutely awful i appreciate that i can't particularly feel sorry for him but i also understand caroline's struggle a little bit where she kind of is conflicted and she does feel a little bit sorry for him because after all like that's somebody close to you who you've known for forever and then they betray you Mm -hmm. like you're going to be conflicted i think it could have been done a lot better but i enjoy that he is not likable and he is at least to some extent accurate in the measures he will take in order to manipulate another person because unfortunately like that's part of the reality that we live in i think he's a gross human being and he deserves what he gets and i wish he would have died from the eucalyptus oil because caroline definitely had an alibi that she was doing historical research and thinking about going back to school and he's the fucking dumbass that drank it she assumes that he was a goddamn adult that knew how to read the back of the bottle and not drink something even though it was shown towards the end that he um might have possibly actually did drink it on purpose to make oh, Caroline clearly upset. Did. He did. Yeah. Oh, well, I think it was more to play on her sympathies, like, oh, look, I'm sick. Aren't you sad? You could be losing me. Uh-huh. Like, let's patch up our relationship. And it's just like, for the, no, that's not how this works. It's but, that, uh, that manipulation tactic. It's the reverse of, if I can't have you, no one will. It's the, if you won't have me, no one will. It's, I'm gonna kill myself if you don't love me. Well, and and kind of the whole idea of, oh, look, I'm so injured and sick, and uh, forgive me for everything, because you could lose me forever, sort of, it's just, it's pathetic and pitiful, and, uh, 
I think it's interesting because, like, I grew up in a household where essential oils are used pretty frequently. I, part of me looks at it and says quack magic, but it seems to help. So <laughs> I was a little curious that that was another thing I found relatable about Caroline, actually. I'm like, well, it's interesting that essential oils are mentioned so much. And I, I was waiting throughout the story to see if that would be, like, some weird play on the apothecary. And then it ended up being, like, a plot point. Mm -hmm. But it's something so common that I think it was done very, very well. I'm just like, oh, fascinating. It's good to know not to drink this bottle of... Uh, eucalyptus oil or whatever i knew eucalyptus was toxic it's toxic to cats oh yeah i knew that <laughs> it never occurred to me to drink a bottle of it though so that's uh that's a right. desperate move you know i'll give him a point one single solid point for the balls to drink something that nasty <laughs> with the possibility of death like sure wow extra move you know Contact Guinness. See if that's a world record for narcissism, but keep it far away from me. Oh yeah, for sure. And I, I love my essential oils, but just with how that stuff smells, there's no way it's ever ending up in my mouth. I'm sorry. <laughs> so another thing that towards the ending of the book was, what did you think about like the ghostly figures on the bridge? Did you read that as Caroline's imagination? Did you think it was actual ghosts? Like, just what was your thought on, on that? This is one of those things that I thought made the book rushed because she really could have done something. Like, I, w I wanted to throw the vial off of the bridge to protect Eliza and her story, but there were women coming towards me on the bridge, and I wanted to wait until they passed. So I acted like I was taking a touristy picture of the, the water. You know, just some addition that's like these women are walking past me and like with the anticipation that they should be getting closer and I think she tried to do that but I don't know if she they were walking like towards the bridge and she was on the bridge and they were like on the embankment or on a sidewalk but like they did not get close enough to her or she could be like why are they wearing old timey clothes to where I would specifically say that's a ghost you saw a ghost ghosties are afoot but instead, it was just, I saw people. You're in London. You're probably seeing a lot of people. Good job, Caroline. That's actually a solid point. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> and it's weird because I like the ambiguity, but again, it's it's one of those things with fiction. You have to suspend your disbelief. And part of me is like, okay, mm -hmm. how much ambiguity is too much? <laughs> you have to make me believe it because it's not that hard. You can almost convinced me anything supernatural but Sarah Penner I don't think she, she took the time to do that she did a really good job like convincing us that like this apothecary lady had all these traumas happen to her and she did a really good job of suggesting that Eliza was molested like she did good jobs with that I just feel like she was running out of pages because it ended squarely at 300 and I just looked at that and was like I am unsatisfied and that is a round number it looks too <laughs> intentional to me, and I don't like it. It was a little bit short. I think, um, listening to the audiobook, it ended up being exactly the length I needed for my trip. It was about, I think it was 10 hours and 20 minutes, somewhere in there. Uh, so for me, it felt rounded out nicely. And uh, But again, I imagine it's a very different experience reading it actually as a physical book versus, like, you know, you're traveling, you're driving, whatever. Yeah. Um, it's like I kind of liked the ambiguity, but also I can see that, that that's, that's part of the problem with historical fiction. Like if you're going to pick a realistic plot, um, well, not plot, but like a, a realistic setting and like real world stuff, like there's going to be things you can nitpick at. And I think a lot of times we focus on historical more than the word fiction. Mm -hmm. And for fiction, you have to be willing to suspend your disbelief a little bit. So it's one of those things where you have to be willing to not think about it too much, I think. Um, and just enjoy the story. Otherwise, it'll drive you crazy. I still want her to give her give it a better go of trying to convince me. How did you like the way that she wrote the story? Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I really enjoyed that it was written in first person perspective, but that it shifted through three different characters. Um, I actually thought that was a, a really fun way to do it because I, I enjoy first person perspective because you can actually really get into a character's head that way. And uh, I haven't read very many stories that are formatted that way where it's first person and it just shifts like that. 
So I thought it was quite a lot of fun. Um, it was a little weird with Eliza because she's a 12 year old girl. And uh, honestly, I was not that well, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Organized or put together as a 12 year old. I feel like it would have been more cutesy and cringy. <laughs> Um, it's accurately written from a 12 year old's perspective, but I, I really loved the way that she just sort of shifted through all the characters and I thought it worked really, really well. You know me, I've been bashing this book for a while. It's not as bad as some of the books that I've read, but I, I wanted her to do more. There was so much hype for it that I wanted to dive into it and it was kind of a rough read for me. Not just because it was a physical book and I don't actually have time to sit down and read, but because, I don't know, I think it should have gone through maybe one more drafting process and um, whoever forced her to stop at 300 pages should feel shame for a thousand generations. <laughs> so overall, like, what would your rating be of the book? Maybe, uh, out of a five, it's a three and a half just because, like, I liked the characters, I liked the story, and I liked the idea, but I'm not going to read it again. That's fair. If, if she doesn't make another book to, you know, give me some more sisterhood story, I don't care. I think, for me, I would probably give it a four out of five, um, and that probably has a great deal to do with, I just found it very cathartic with what I'm going through. And uh, I love having books read to me. Like, uh, I remember as a kid, my mom used to read to me. She actually did that all throughout college whenever I would come home and my brother happened to be at the house at the same time. I thoroughly enjoy having stories read to me. And I thought it was a nice book. It was the perfect length for what I'm reading. But I would be very curious to know um, if I actually choose to sit down with the paperback and actually read it that way. I would be curious to know if my rating would change, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good story. Um, I thought it had a reasonably satisfactory ending, like regardless of how realistic, quote unquote, it was. Um, it is good. It's a perfect sort of book for if you're traveling, if you're going to be like laying on the beach, soaking up some star damage. It's a perfect book for that. It's fun. I wouldn't, I would call it brain candy in a way, like it's a fun little read, but it's probably not going to change your life to read it, if that makes sense. That's fair. And your brain candy term makes a lot of sense. I don't think I enjoy sweet little treats. I want the whole cake right now. I want it to hurt my stomach and I want it to be a pain to pass. <laughs> I want to mourn my books. Like <laughs> When I finished my elementary school long obsession book series, it was months before I picked up anything and it was so hard. I couldn't find anything I liked. I thought the world was going to end. Oh, no. <laughs> well, see, I enjoy a good book that makes me uh, cry for several weeks on end, and I enjoy being upset when my ca favorite characters die, but part of me, honestly, just... Like, my life is hard enough. Part of me likes brain candy books, and uh, this was honestly something that I'm so glad you recommended it to me. It was... It was a lot of fun to listen to, and it just came at the perfect time. So I am I'm very gl glad that we had the opportunity to do this and then to discuss it together. It was absolutely fantastic. What was your favorite part of the book, by the way? The ending. <laughs> <laughs> Closing the book and being done. It, oh, dear. <laughs> it took me a year to read. It's not that it's terrible. It's just it took me a year to read. I had it read to me by, like, a wonderfully talented uh, narrator, so I, I had a great time. Um, what was your favorite part? Oh, my favorite part was when Caroline actually breaks into the hidden room, because part of me is like, I want to do that so badly. <laughs> but I was mad that her phone wasn't charged all the way, because part of me, like, I sleep with my phone charged in, and I'm probably, like, just killing my battery, because I never want to leave the house without it being at least 98%. And it's like, of course, your phone isn't charged up all the way. But she finds the location of the lost apothecary. She finds this incredible secret. She breaks in and it's like, and your phone is dying. Cool. So like that, I, I love the discovery of it. And it's like, of course, they had to do something so she couldn't just stay there and look through everything. But it, it, it bothered me at the same time because I'm like, I would have taken the book, honestly. Like, I'm not above that. <laughs> um, I don't know. I probably would have come back in the day and seen if it was, like, able to be picked up because some things deteriorate That's at weird fair. rates and I wouldn't want it to, like, fall apart in my backpack while I'm climbing over that weird fence. 
that's fair too and it's like i understand that it's very delicate but part of me is like no nope, it's coming with me like i'm not all about his well I, I shouldn't say that uh the adventurous spirit in me is like nope this is coming home with me this is mine now um the rational person in me would probably say okay let's preserve the book and not hurt anything and just take a couple of pictures but it really bothered me that her battery was so low because it's like you're leaving your hotel room in london yeah why yeah. is your phone not fully charged but I-, I had my trip to ireland planned for two years and two of the most important things that i had packed were um a pocket translator and external charging pack well and honestly like uh i get that where she was apparently is pretty safe in the book but i don't like leaving the house without my phone fully charged especially if it's a little bit dark out or early morning hours anything like that and i don't know part of me is like good for you not being tethered to your phone all the time but the other part of me is like why is it not at 100 percent, caroline you're in a new environment and you are a woman like don't do this to yourself who mm. would you recommend this to um, I would say anybody from like 16 years old, it could definitely be like a young adult's book to anyone, honestly, through like the age of the, like two of the main characters who I think are in their early 30s, so. In the more relatable nice. age range of like yeah. young adult, maybe some teenager to um, older, or not older adult, or like, well, I guess older adult, but like general adult. Uh, right. Um, anybody who's at the point where they might be going through this or have gotten to the point where they will either have experienced it soon or are <laughs> just people who have reached that point in their life. I think that older people could certainly enjoy it, but I think it's something that you certainly wouldn't necessarily like recommend to a middle schooler because there's certain themes in there that they're just not going to understand fully. Um, so definitely like young adults to like those of us who are starting to have our knees creak and stuff um, on our way to 30 and a little bit older. This book is definitely made for people who are looking for a community where they can express their deepest pains, where they know that they will receive a compassionate and caring response. I really like the overtones of a compassionate sisterhood bond in the book for both timelines. If you have a trauma that you would like to work through, this could be a good narrative to follow, but it is centered around women's trauma, specifically with men. Aside from that, I think that this is a really good title for um, exemplifying how wise women can be. It's well worth listening to, particularly if you've gone through some stuff or are in the process of it, because we need books to make us braver, and I think this book does that very, very well, depending on your situation. So yeah, it was a, it was a real joy to read, and uh, thank you for recommending it to me. Of course. I think that's everything. So lastly, uh, where can people find you? Um, you can find me on Instagram at trinatakeatart.com. Uh, you can just Google my name as well. My website should pop up there. There's not too many people with my name, which is very nice. Um, and you can just poke around and find my artwork there. Um, there will also be a link to my Instagram from there. So, yeah, please come check it out. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to Maven's Patreon and support an artist. She's amazing. Thank and you. I love her so much. And thank you for having me. All right. Do you want to say goodbye? Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, well, that looks like everything that we had time for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked today's content, please give us a like, a comment, and maybe a follow or subscribe. I'm on Patreon, Twitter, and Instagram at The Happiest Pumpkin. If you have any recommendations, please submit them via Patreon or emailing me at mavenpage at gmail.com. That is M-A-E-V-Y-N-P-A-I-G-E at gmail.com. Thank you so much, and I hope you find some time to read.
Lost Apothecary because I like the story. I'm a witch. The idea of a hidden apothecary is just the amount of magic hidden in plain sight that we all need, but I think it couldn't have come sooner. I'm going to read the pages that Sarah Penner put in. I want to think that these pages are the reason why the story seems to have a more abrupt end, because she wanted to save pages for these. I am only going to read it because I think it's important. Nella Clavinger's Apothecary of Poisons. Excerpt from dissertation submitted by Caroline Parswell, M. Phil Candidate in 18th Century and Romantic Studies, University of Cambridge. Annotations and Assorted Remedies as Recovered from the Journals at Bear Alley, Faring, London, EC4A4HHUK. Hemlock Julep for a gentleman of exceptional intel intelligence and command of language. These qualities will remain until the very end, which may be useful when needing to extract a confession or account of events. Fatal dosage, six large leaves, although an especially large male may require eight. Initial symptoms are vertigo and sensation of being very cold. Recommended preparation is a decoction or julep similar to thorn apple. Extraction juice from fresh leaves crushed and drained. Orpiment, yellow, arsenic. Because this remedy takes on the consistency of flour or fine sugar, it is suited for the especially gluttonous gentleman who may enjoy a sweet lemon or banana pudding. A most curious mineral, note highly soluble in hot water, fumes smell like garlic, hence do not serve warm. Used to kill household ferments of any kind, human or animal. Lethal, lethal dose is three grains. Canthrides blister beetle. When aroused before incapacitation is desired, as such at the brothel or in the bedchamber, these insects may be found in low laying fields in cool weather near root crops, best harvested under new or young moon, so as not to confuse with harmless beetles similar in appearance. Crush a single male will excrete a milk-like fluid to test for burn upon skin before full harvest. To prepare, roast, then grind in a wide basin until thin. Dispense in dark, thick liquid, wine, honey, or syrup. And if you'll remember, this is the poison that killed the husband. Black Buttercup Hellborn. For the gentleman prone to spells of madness or hallucination, possibly due to overconsumption of drink or laudum drops, he will believe hellbore poisoning symptoms are the result of his own demons. Seeds, sap, roots, all poisonous. Look for black blooms and roots, which prevent mix-up of other species in the buttercup family. Initial symptoms are dizziness, stupor, thirst, and sensation of suffocation wolf Spain or monk's hood, for the most devout who may feign the wrath of God in their final moments by way of physical outburst. wolf Spain acts upon the nerves of the limbs, calming them. Such theatrical reactions will be impossible. Cultivation notes. Flowering plant is very easy to grow. Soil must be well drained. Harvest when root is half inch thick at the base of the plant. Handle with gloves. Dry the plucked root for three days. Shred root fibers with two sharp knives. Dispense in mustard root sauce, such as horseradish. Excellent when supper courses are to be served individually. Avoid buffets. Nux vomica, poison nut. The most reliable of remedies, as quick acting as it is irreversible. Suitable for administration to all men, regardless of age proportion or intellect. For extraction of agent, grind finely the brown bean, 
also known as crofig, in very low doses may be used to treat fever, plague, and hysteria, being warmed very bitter. Produces a yellowish color when stewed. Victim will experience severe thirst at first symptom. Egg yolk is the preferred preparation. This is the poison that killed Mr. Animal. Devil's snare or thorn apple. Due to immediate delirium, even the cleverest conspirator will be caught unaware. Ideal for attorneys and estate executors. Egg-shaped seeds are not rendered benign, but drying or heating thorn apple produces greater delirium than other nightshades. Animals, wiser than men, will avoid the wheat due to its taste and disagreeable odor. Find the plant in undisturbed areas. Graveyard yew. Yew trees are said to lust after corpses, an ideal remedy to speed along death in an already ailing or older gentleman. Poison agent resides in seeds, needles, and bark. Needles, least preferred, very fibrous. Often found in medieval village graveyards, trees upward of 400 to 600 years old. Seek younger trees, trees for most desirous seeds. Preparation. Bark, bulis, or suppository. suppository. Caution against dispensing, dispensing to undertakers or cemetery groundsmen. They are familiar with the odor of evergreens. They may thwart an attempt at administration. Phallus fungus. Death may be delayed five days or more, best administered when a will or final testament must be amended in the presence of a witness or family member who needs time to arrive at the victim's sickbed. The deadliest mushroom appearing at the base of certain trees in the second half of the year. Cooking does not render the fun fungus benign. A reliable toxin, though very difficult to obtain, and evasive rem remedy a, as the victim will be nearing recovery. This indicates imminent Death by poison is, at its very nature, an intimate affair. An element of trust generally, generally exists, exists between the victim and the villain. I don't suggest poisoning anyone, but I do suggest that everyone remain familiar with herbs and herbal remedies in the coming days. Look to the people who can't afford to go to the doctor. They'll have all of your answers.